The title of my message today is, What Makes You Think You Can't Do It? Thank you, Jesus. Like I said earlier in the early service, our health care workers deserve a big thank you. They wear them for, what, 14, 16 hours a day, and we don't have to wear them near that long. Uh, I don't know about you all, but sometimes I feel like I'm suffocating with them on. So whenever we see a health care worker, we need to say thank you. When I gave my message on August the 25th, 2019, I immediately breathed a sigh of relief and thought to myself, it has been at least 20 some odd years since I did it and it would not happen again in my lifetime. <laughs> yeah, I laughed too. But wait, God doesn't see things like we do. And I heard a small, soft voice say to me, don't be so sure of that. Because there was no one around me, I knew it was God speaking to me. I proceeded to explain to him that I didn't have any idea what I would speak on. And if I did, which I probably wouldn't, and he proceeded to explain to me about ordinary people used by God. Wow, that's probably the entire universe, especially me. I didn't think any more about it until I read the upper room for September the 7th, just two weeks after I spoke, entitled Ordinary Heroes, with the scripture taken, 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 31. At this time, I would like to share this article. In popular literature, plays, and poetry, the common people often have unimportant roles while they while the exalted parts go to kings, princes, and princesses. But the New Testament flip, flips the percept, that perceptive. In God's story, the common people take center stage. It is not king's eloquent decree that makes Jesus stop, but rather a blind beggar who desperately calls out his name. As others rushed by, his side, by this man, Jesus saw his value. The widow who do, do, donated only two copper coins is a heroine. Jesus did not ignore the common people or, pray, or, or portray them as buffoons. In the gospel, we, we read about the nameless and the prodigal son and the paralytic healed. What a contrast to other stories of kings and rulers. We like to read about celebrities and people who lead glamorous lives but God often does the opposite of what we expect. God prefers to focus on ordinary people and how they become quiet heroes through loving acts of faith. God invites us to do the same. After a lot of reading and some research, I came up with a list of what we would call ordinary people and how because God used them became unordinary. I found a list of 20 messed up Bible heroes and what, and what we can learn from them. Number one, Adam. First man was a blame shifter who couldn't resist peer pressure. Genesis 3.12. Two, Eve. First woman couldn't control her appetite and should we say had the first eating disorder. <laughs> Genesis 3.6. Cain, the firstborn human, murdered his brother, Genesis 4, 8. Noah, the last righteous man on earth at the time, became drunk and slept nude in his tent, Genesis 9, 20 through 21. Hopefully we don't do that, but maybe we do. Abraham, the forefather of faith, let other men walk off with his wife on two different occasions, Genesis 12, 20. Sarah, the most gorgeous woman by popular opinion, let her husband sleep with another woman and then hated her for it. Genesis 16. Lot, who lost his father early in life, had a serious problem with choosing the wrong company. Genesis 18 through 20. Job, supposedly a contemporary of Abraham and the epitome of faith, suffered from the nagging of a faithless wife. Job 2.9. 
Hugh, I was so hoping I'd get an amen, and I didn't. <laughs> Isaac, who was almost killed by his father, talked into concealing their marriage. Genesis 26. Rebecca, the first male order bride, turned out to be a rather cunning wife. Genesis 27. Jacob, who, out who outwrestled God and was pretty much a pathological deceiver. Genesis 25, 27, and 30. Rachel, who wrote the book on love at first sight and was a nomadic kleptomaniac. Genesis 31, 19. Reuben, the pride and firstborn of Jacob, was very odd, who slept with his father's concubine. Genesis 35, 21. Moses, the humblest man on the face of the earth, Numbers 12, 13, had a very serious problem with his temper. Exodus 2, 32, verse 19, and Numbers 20, verse 11. Aaron, who watched Jehovah triumph over Pharaoh, formed in a detestable idol during an apparent episode of attention deficit disorder or perhaps colossal amnesia. Exodus 32. Miriam, the songwriter, had sibling jealousy and agreed for power. Numbers 12. Samson, who put Arnold Schwarzenegger and Jesse Ventura to shame, was, hostly, was hopelessly entangled with a disloyal wife and ended up taking his own life. Judges 16. Eli, who ruled over Israel, was a hopelessly incapable father who lost his sons to immorality and to an untimely death. 1 Samuel 2.4. Saul, the first and powerful king of Israel, was apparently a psychotic with mani mani maniac bursts of anger, episodes of deep depression, traces of delusions. He too committed suicide. 1 Samuel 16, 18, 19, and 31. David, friend of God, concealed his adultery with a murder. 2 Samuel 11. And last, Solomon, the wisest man in the world, who lived a very permissive lifestyle. 1 Kings 11. I know I have painted all these individuals of the Bible in a very unpleasant state, but please take a time to read, as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story, and see how all of these prophets did the will of God despite their downfalls and shortcomings. Having weaknesses doesn't mean we don't have what it takes. It just means we are not in control. We don't know everything and we, and we can be stopped. Weaknesses, weakness means we desperately need God. And the plea for my soul and yours is that we would embrace weakness, not despise it. As it says in Romans 26 and 2 Corinthians 12, 10. Let us remember that God uses weakness to bring us to call on him. Weakness does not always imply failing to have faith because look at Jesus in the garden before he was crucified. He fell to the ground in great distress and cried out to his father. I found this little story and I would like to share it with you. A father said to his son, what's wrong son? Can't you lift that rock out? The dad asked. No, sir, the boy said, I can't do it. Have you used all the strength that's available to you? The father asked, yes, sir, the boy said. No, you haven't, the father said. You didn't ask me to help you. Faith is of the heart invisible to men. It is that element of trust that is invisible. Your obedience is, is proven by your outward conduct. The principle of Jesus' life was his obeying his Father, both on earth and in heaven. Our attitude should be the same. Ephesians 5.16 I know at this point of my message, you think I am being hard on the ordinary people in the Bible that were being used by God. However, if we would stop and think about the people that I have mentioned, you would realize we are no different than they were. Yes, the circumstances and the excuses that they use may be different, but if we were to really examine our reasons for not obeying God, 
they could be more alike than we realize. It may be, I'm not a good speaker. I'm afraid. I don't have time. I don't have enough money. People might make fun of me. Whatever the reason, until we put all of our trust in him, we will continue to find excuses for not trusting him completely and doing his will, whatever it may be, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. At this time, I would like to share with you the 20 cans, not cannots, cans of success. Number one, why should I say I can't when the Bible says I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength? Philippians 4, 13. Why should I lack when I know that God should supply all my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus? Philippians 4, 19. Why should I fear when the Bible says God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and sound mind? 2 Timothy 1, 7. Why should I lack faith to fulfill my calling, knowing that God has allotted to me a measure of faith? Romans 12, 3. Why should I be weak when the Bible says that the Lord is the strength of my life and that I will display strength and take actions because I know God? Psalm 27, 1, Daniel 11:32. Why should I allow Satan's supremacy over my life when he that is in me is greater than he that is in the world? 1 John 4, 4. Why should I accept defeat when the Bible says that God always leads me in triumph? 2 Corinthians 2.14 Why should I lack wisdom when Christ became wisdom to me from God and God gives to me generously when I ask for it? 1 Corinthians 1.13 and James 1.5 Why should I be depressed when I can recall to mind God's loving kindness, compassion, and faithfulness and have hope? Lamentations 3.21-23 through 23. Why should I worry and fret when I can cast all my anxiety on Christ who cares for me. 1 Peter 5, 7. Why should I ever be in bondage knowing that there is liberty where the spirit of the Lord is? 2 Corinthians 3, 17, Galatians 5, 1. Why should I feel condemned when the Bible says I am not condemned because I am in Christ? Romans 8, 1. Why should I feel alone when Jesus said he is with me always and he will never leave me nor forsake me. Matthew 28, 20, and Hebrews 13, 5. Why should I feel accursed or that I am the victim of bad luck when the Bible says that Christ redeemed me from the curse of the law that I might receive his spirit? Galatians 3, 13, and 14. Why should I be discontented when I, like Paul, can learn to be content in all my circumstances? Philippians 4, 11. Why should I feel worthless when Christ became sin on my behalf that I might become the righteousness of God in him? 2 Corinthians 5.21 Why should I have a persecution complex knowing that nobody can be against me when God is for me? Romans 8.31 Why should I be confused when God is the author of peace and he gives me knowledge through his indwelling spirit? 1 Corinthians 14, 38, and, and 2nd chapter, verse 12. Why should I feel like a failure when I am a conqueror in all things through Christ? Romans 8, 37. Why should I let the pressures of life bother me when I can take courage knowing that Jesus has overcome the world and his tribulations? John 16, 33. As, as you all and the whole world knows, we're in the midst of COVID-19. But I had something happen to me this past week that kind of brought COVID-19 into perspective in a conversation that I had with an individual. I won't mention any names. <clears throat> That's not important. The conversation went something like this. 
I think it's wonderful that you can get up and speak like that. I could never do it. When I got done talking to the individual, I left, went about my business, and I went to food line, and I come back down, and I, I said, but I felt the Lord was leading me. I needed to go back to that individual. So back to that individual I went. Uh, to say the least, I think they thought I was probably a little bit nuts why I did this, but I felt God was leading me that I need to do that. When the individual said I could never speak like that, my response was, I can't do what you can do either. I can't play music. That's not my gift. I can't build stuff. That's not my gift. I'm really good at tearing up, but I'm not good at fixing. But God has given every last one of us a gift. As the upper room said, it might be small. Or in your eyes, you might think it's small. But in God's eyes, it's not small. It's anything but. And the reason why I mentioned COVID-19, it seems like we're kind of confined, especially our elderly, in their homes. And I got to thinking, wow. COVID-19 is going on, but God doesn't have to stop working. He doesn't. It might be a phone call. Everybody has a phone. A lot of people has them right on their hip. Me, I have to look for mine. But you can make a phone call. You can send a card. You can be in a supermarket. You could be at your work. You could be wherever you are and you can smile. Granted, you got a mask on, but I think sometime the expression on your face will still come through even with the mask on. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, I hope nobody ever thinks that their gift is irrelevant because it's not. God can take that teeny tiny little gift that you think you have and he can, my expression, he could blow it clear out of proportion. He can do with that whatever he wants to do because we serve an almighty God and there's nothing that he can't do. If we let him work through us, there is nothing we can't do. So my thought to you is don't ever feel inferior. Because God doesn't make inferiority. He doesn't make it. He takes what he's given you and he uses it to the greatest that he can use it. We must never forget that God is more interested in your availability than in your ability. Can I repeat that? God is not interested in your availability but your ability. If we use, if we were to depend strictly on our ability, we would fail miserably, but we would remember that following God, there is nothing we can't do. And if God calls you or me to do something, no matter how hard we may think it is, he has promised, I will never leave you or forsake you. And I will equip you with whatever you need because my word will never return void, and he will accomplish everything he wants to accomplish. Amen.